Welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is William Briggs. Uh, we're going to continue our class on uncertainty and probability theory, the logic of science, episode 15. Uh, I'm going to prove to you probability has no direction. And this is going to be extremely important when I later show you that probability cannot give you cause. You can bring cause to probability, but you're not going to be able to extract cause from probability. Uh, and that has all sorts of implications in all these models that people are using, particularly statistical models where claims of causality are flooding science, uh, absolutely spurious claims of causality. So we'll get to all of that in due time, but I'll give you a very simple proof today. Uh, we're going to start with the homework and then uh, go over the homework I gave you yesterday. And then we're going into chapter three of Jane's. Uh, we're going to stay in Jane's for a couple of weeks. And then we'll get back to my book when we talk more about, uh, back to uncertainty, when we talk more about what probability is not. So I gave you an, uh, a, a, I'm hiding this behind my back here. I gave you a homework problem. I said, imagine you have 70 objects. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 70. And we had to choose five of these objects. So we had to take five of them. And then we had another set of one, two, up to 25, and we had to select just one of these. And I said, how many uh, different ways can we do this? And the reason for it is, I, I kind of gave it away when I blundered it out in the, I, I bought this visual aid here, uh, Mega Millions. I couldn't remember if it was Mega Millions or Powerball. This is exactly the, the, the structure of this Mega Millions. The probability you win depends on these calculations right here. Uh, I, I haven't checked this one. I, I think the drawing has already occurred, but I tell you, it's a good thing I didn't because if I did win, I wouldn't do this lecture. I wouldn't do any of the remaining lectures. I'd be out of here. You guys would never hear from me again. So maybe it's a good thing I didn't check this because, boy, these, these look like some good numbers down there, don't they? Okay. So how does this work? Well, we have 70 choices. For the first number, we could take any one of those. And after we've taken the first number, well, we have 69 uh, possibilities for the second number. We've taken one away. There's only 68. 68 times 67 times 66. And then we have one of these. There's, we have to take one of the 25, so there's another 25 possibilities right there. However, the order doesn't matter. The order doesn't matter. So these numbers, they print them out in numerical order, but if I had selected them, this is 13 and 17, but if I picked 17 and 13 plus all the others on my sheet, uh, it would still be a winner. So the order doesn't matter. And how many different ways are there arranging five numbers? Well, we learned that last time. It would be five factorial, and that happens to be 120. And how many different ways are there choosing one number? Well, there's only one, so times one. And this equals, uh, ooh, I forgot to do the calculation. Is it 300 million or 3 billion? I forgot to do the calculation. Uh, it's not really important. I think it's 300 some million. 300 some million, roughly. So you have, a, uh, you have the, the probability of winning the jackpot anyway uh, is, one in 300 million, I think that's the right number, a little higher than that. Uh, there's other ways you can win. You can just get the mega ball correct, which is one out of 25. So you have a one out of 25 chance of winning two bucks, uh, which is the cost of the ticket. And I guess if you get four of them, uh, you get some, I don't, I, I, I'm not quite sure what the, the rules are to the thing, but you get something. And you can calculate all those probabilities in exactly the same way. So that was part one of the homework. And part two of the homework was to say, I could either add, uh, I could add more balls. I could add 20 more balls to this thing. I could have 71, 72, all the way up to 99. Or I could keep the original 70 and just pick six instead of five. And which of these would give more chances? And if you figured that out, if you figured out how to do this original one, it's going to be exactly the same. So we could just look at the ratio of these kinds of things, right? That's one way to do it. So if I had six balls, 
instead of just five, I'd have, by the time I got down to the sixth one, I'd have times 65, still times 25. Instead of 120 ways, which is five times four times three times two times one, it would be six times five times four, so I could just multiply this by six. Or if I had it out of 99, it would be 99 times 98 times 97 times 96 times 95 times 25 all out of 120. So the 120s would cancel, the 25s cancel, and you just have to figure out this thing divided by six and this right there. And I actually did that. I remember to do that much anyway. That, uh, that gives you, this is uh, 8.6 billion. And this one up here gives you 15.7 billion, almost double. So picking an extra ball gives you a lot more possibilities, twice as many more possibilities roughly as adding 20 more balls to the mix. And if you had this as the, 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 the probability of winning then goes down to, I think it's 300 and, I think I did this right, 393 billion. So the chance is 100, one out of, uh, did I do that right? Or is that 100 million? Ah. You, you can figure out the numbers. You can plug them into a calculator. But that's how you solve these problems. And that's just, all counting problems are like this. It's the same in all, it's, it's just like uh, back in, uh, when you were in middle school or high school or whatever and they gave you story problems. This is just a story problem. And we have to translate the story problem to the simple math that we know. Once we get it into the form of the simple math that we know, why well, everything just pops out. It's just sort of brute calculation, no difficulties. The trick is always getting it into the proper math. That's the, always the hard part. That's the most difficult part. That's why I always urge you to try to solve a simpler problem first, because the math, I mean, any, anybody can multiply these numbers together. That's, that, that takes absolutely no effort. But getting to know the formula for them, I mean, getting to understand that this is exactly the way you have to do it, that's the trick. Okay, that's it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start building up our first probability distributions. We've learned that uh, probability can be a number. It can take zero for false, conditionally false, one for conditionally true. And because of uh, the statistical syllogism, we can assign equal probability to uh, events of which we know nothing to differentiate them. And I'm going to give you one such event now. And I told you we can build up all of probability from just those simple facts and the probability of a proposition given certain evidence plus the probability of its contrary given that same evidence has to equal one. One or the other has to be true. That, that comes from the law of identity. So we, we built all this up logically and now we're going to build all this up uh, in mathematics. We're going to show, I think the first one we're going to do, James does, is a, a hyper geometric distribution. So here is our evidence. We always have to have evidence. He uses B and he has an urn or a bag or a box or a object that can take states and it takes, it has inside of it M red balls and N total. And the remaining balls, which therefore must be uh, N minus M white balls. Simple as that. Now James unfortunately falls prey to the fair unfair dice thing that we talked about the last two weeks in a row. He says imagine I'm blinded and I've got them all mixed up and all that doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters as we well know. You don't know the difference what's going on with a box. If someone told you there's a box it has N total balls they gave you the N to 50. And they said there's M of them are red and then minus M are white. You don't know what the order is if you can't see N. If you can see, obviously that changes the evidence. I can see the white ones on top. I'm reaching in and grabbing a white one. Given the conditional probability I'm grabbing a white one, what, given, given the condition, the premise I'm grabbing the white one, what's the probability I'm grabbing a white one? Well, there's no mystery there. There's no paradox. You've used that information to deduce something. But if you don't know, you're just reaching in and grabbing, or it's a machine that happens to have these states, uh, then 
we don't know and so the probability will be obvious so uh, he also introduces a little bit of notation just for ease r i is red on the ith draw and w i is white white okay all right so let's do the easy ones first what's the probability of a red ball on the first draw given it's all conditional it's conditional on this this is where the ordinary textbooks where james does not go wrong ordinary textbooks would forget to put this there they would just write the probability of r1 for instance doesn't work that way i've already given you a situation where i can see the balls my information changes. the probability changes if you change the information you change the premises change the assumption change the evidence change the observations you change the probability no getting around it that's the lesson of this of this particular class well this is no this is no mystery there's no difficult math involved in this why there's m red balls and there's and total balls simple right and obviously we could do the same thing for the probability of white of white on the first draw why there's uh we don't know there's m minus m whoops and minus m out of n there we go no tricks so far how about this the probability of two in a row a red on the second one and a red on the first well from Bayes theorem we remember we're going to use just those just the simplest theorems that we have we're just going to go to town with those things and and, and and uh, come, come to more and more difficult math. Simple as that, really. We got the probability of R2 given R1 B times the probability of R1 given B. All we did was just use Bayes' theorem to bust that up. We proved Bayes' theorem weeks and weeks ago. And so that's the probability of R2, assuming we drew R1 on the first time, plus the information we have, times the probability of R1. Well, the probability of R1 we just did a minute ago, M minus N. And assuming we've taken out R1, why then we must have only M minus 1 left, correct? We've assumed we've taken one out, and we've taken a ball out, regardless red or white, so it must be N minus 1. So there's the probability. The hypergeometric uh, 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 distribution is built on answering questions what's the probability of you know so many so many red so many r's so many red and so many white given b or i could say i've already drawn out this many reds and this many whites and i want to know what's the probability of so many reds and so many whites in the future we just get it from this distribution. It, it's all the hypergeometric does is just apply a formula like this over and over again. That's all it does. Until we figure out exactly the mathematical form, we figure out a simplification of it, and voila, there it is. Uh, the hypergeometric distribution. And again, the point of it is, I could say, well, what's the probability? I want three reds and four whites, given just this information. I'm going to have seven draws, so three reds and four whites. What's the probability of seeing that? Okay. Or I could assume I've already seen three uh, reds and four whites, and I want to know the probability of two more reds and two more whites and two new draws. I can calculate that. I can calculate any proposition that's relevant to the information I have. Any proposition about these observables, you notice now these are observables. Everything here is observable. It's real. Uh, there's no parameters or mystery or anything like this. There's no subjectivity to any of this. These are all just hard and fast logical mathematical rules. And I can figure this out, and that has the form of a hypergeometric distribution. I won't pester you with it here by writing it up on the board. It'll be in the lecture notes. Uh, you can find the links below, or it's in chapter three of Jane's, or you can look it up on the web. There's an, 
you know, dozens and dozens of websites that have it for you. Okay. But now let's, I, I started out by saying probability has no direction. So let's continue this example right here. So I'm going to erase all this and talk about directionality and probability. And remembering probability, I, I'm going to say this so many times you're going to get sick of it. And I hope you do. I hope you do get sick of this. You get sick of the idea that you change the evidence and probability, you change the probability. All right, Briggs, I got it, I got it. Well, just keep that in mind in your real life examples. You're out there and you're a statistician or a doctor, psychologist, somebody, and you've done a regression and you add one more patient. You have just changed your evidence. You have changed your evidence. You have changed your model. Doesn't, people don't normally speak that way, but that's the proper way to speak. And therefore you will change your probability. This is inescapable. And we need to have that in the back of our mind at all times, or the forefront of our mind, especially if we're trying to communicate our results with somebody. All right. So, let's calculate this. The probability of red on the second draw. So what's that? Well, if I have red on the second draw, that logically means I must have had a first draw, correct? And on that first draw, what could have happened? Well, I could have had a red or a white. So using the standard rules of probability we learned, this is going to be the probability of R2, red on white, whoops, red on the first one or white on the first one. And we could distribute this just using Boolean algebra. So this is going to be the probability of red on the first, or the second one, excuse me, and red on the first, or uh, red on the second, and white on the, holy moly, white on the first, not second. I'll, I'll say it again because I realize I, I boogered that up in, on the notation, but not in speech. Again, we want the probability of red on the second draw, which logically means we had two draws, and what could have happened on the first? Well, we could have had a red or a white. So the probability of red on the second draw must be the probability of red on the second draw, and either a red or white on the first, logically. And we could distribute this, red on the second, red on the first, or red on the second, and uh, white on the first. And this equals, we just bust that or out of there, probability of R2, R1, given B, plus the probability of R2, white 1, given B. And we use Bayes' theorem again, which is going to equal the probability, which one did I do? Yes, I did of R2 given R1B times the probability of R1 given B. That's just using Bayes' theorem right there. We started by doing that, no mystery. And this is going to be Bayes' theorem again, plus the probability of R2 given white on the first times the probability of white on the first. Huh? Voila. Okay, what's the probability of red on the first draw, we did that, n over m. What's the probability of white on the first draw? Well, we did that, that was one of our initial easy deductions. I got that upside down, don't I? Pardon, 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 pardon. m over n, there's m red balls and n, n total. See, notation, notation will just kill you every time. Just kills you every time. Well. This one, we know where our n has been reduced by 1 because we've taken one ball out. Okay, so we got n minus 1. And the probability of red, well, there's still, in this particular case, we've taken out a white ball, so there's still m uh, red balls in there. Okay, that's fine. And this one, well, again, we've taken out a ball, so we know that the, the denominator is now n minus 1. And therefore, we've also know we've taken out a red one. This is our assumption. We assume it's true. We have taken out a red one. So there can be m minus 1. 
I am going to go up here. My apologies for the lack of board space. So let's just solve this. We have n minus 1, n, n minus 1, n in the denominator. So we have the same denominators. So we have n minus 1, n. We got m minus 1 times m uh, plus m times n minus w. So far, so good. You're with me? Simple algebra. We could distribute that, keeping the same denominator. Let's distribute that. We got m squared minus m plus nm, mn minus, this is supposed to be a, a w. Do I have everything backwards? N minus W, dumbass. Excuse me. Me. Me is a dumbass. There's no W's in this thing. It's all M's. I started killing myself with notation again. It's all M's. We don't have... I, I, didn't, I didn't label the white balls M. Boy, you're going to kill me for this. But we get the idea, I hope. Uh, minus M squared. It's all M's. We only have M's. We have N minus M. That's the number of white balls. Point of it is... You see what's going to happen, I hope, besides my blunder. These m's go away. I could pull out the m, and I'll have n minus 1 over n times n minus 1, which equals m over n, which you will recall equals the probability of red on the second draw. So the probability of red on the second draw is just n m over m because we don't know what happened on the first one. This is our first clue that something about causality is gone wrong in our thinking. If we think we can get probability, if we think we can get causality out of probability, not accepting my idiotic blunder of uh, carrying a w instead of an m. See, one's upside down or the other. Terrible. I, I, I do these equations and I write them over and over and I make these kind of, same kind of idiotic mistakes when I'm doing them on my own. Uh, so when, now when it's time for the performance, I do them again. At least I'm consistent. You'll find yourself doing these too unless you're particularly facile at them. Okay. Your homework, by the way, will be to calculate what's the probability of R3 given B. It's not going to be any mystery to you if you follow my explanation so far. But this tells us it's exactly, and don't forget, the, what was the probability of R1 given B? That was also M over N. Because we don't know anything else. And it gets weirder than that. We don't know what's going on over here. We don't know what was going on in any previous draws. Therefore, the only thing we can say now, Jane says he has a robot figuring this stuff out, but it's the same as if you're think, figuring it out. We don't know what came before. Therefore, the only knowledge you have is the number of red balls and the number of white balls in the total. That's it. That's the only knowledge you have. Therefore, this must be the probability. And we've calculated it exactly. Okay. So we see that probability doesn't really have a direction. And there's no memory to it. It's only based on the information that we assume. So he gives an example. Let's have a particular example of m of 2. n of 2, two balls, one of which is red. So the probability, we have did this already, if you remember. You'll, maybe you'll, it'll key you remember. What's the probability of drawing out a, a red ball conditional on this information on the first draw? Well, it's a half. There's two balls, one of which is red, a half. Okay. But what's the probability of drawing out a red ball on the first? Here, here comes the, the mystery. Assuming sometime in the future we're going to take a ball out of there and we're going to pull it out and it's going to be red. Okay. So what's the probability of a red on the first draw? 
it must be zero even though we haven't taken that one out yet because we have assumed in the future sometime the second draw is going to give us uh, one fewer red balls in the urn and since there's only two to or uh, one to begin with the probability of drawing out a, a red on the first one must be zero we did this uh, when we did the card guessing experiment. I don't know if you remember that, the ESP, the, the ESP, the psychic, uh, trying to think about what cards are going to be there. That's where these kind of calculations lead. Probability, it doesn't have a direction. It's only dependent on the information that we assumed. So you can't get the direction of causality in here. You, if you just come up with a probability model, you're not going to get the direction of causality out of these kinds of things. We bring, it's going to turn out cause to the models, our suppositions, our premises, and all that kind of thing. And we try to extract information assuming that's going to be true. All right? We don't calculate and assume we can get a particular direction out of probability. We've already seen it just doesn't work this way. Now, James goes on to develop this particular uh, example more so. It doesn't matter how many balls you have in the urn or anything like this. In this simple situation, you could have uh, any number of n, any number of m, and all of this stuff works out no matter how many things you're talking about. If you assume whatever is going to happen in the future does affect the past. The future affects the past, not in a causal way. Aha, now we can start thinking about quantum mechanics a little bit too, can't we? The, 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 the future has affected the past, but in an a-causal way. This is going to be key to thinking about all this probability. An a-causal way has happened here. There's no, oh, greedy's down there. There's no cause to this. Maybe he'll come up here. Come up here. You're not going to do it, eh? Uh, greedy is the, the, the local chipmunk here. He's always begging for nuts. He comes to watch, but he's too scared to come up on the books. Uh, that's it for now. Uh, the, the homework is, the, is to, again to calculate the probability of R3. It's useful to go through this, uh, unless you're so good at math and you're so used to it, you don't have to bother. But I want you to try that calculation that, that I did and do it for yourself. Now we're going to uh, move on from the hypergeometric and move on to other distributions uh, that we can do, that we can calculate the form of just based on our simple information that we have. And then we're going to do, I think he does elementary uh, parameter estimation or something like this. Well, well, we'll do that too. And then we'll move back into my book uh, and look at what probability is not. We need to understand what probability is not. We have our first lesson here, what probability is not, where the past, uh, the future affects the, the, the past in an a-causal way. So we must keep clear the direction of causality and all that kind of thing. But that's in our minds. It's not in these equations. No, I can't stress this enough, and I'll continue to go over it and over again. All right, that's it for this time. Uh, below are the links where you can find uh, more information. I welcome questions and everything. I'll try to get to them uh, either in many of the sources where this goes or in next week's lecture. That's it for now. Thanks for listening.